Hello, everyone. Adam here. Uh, as you can probably tell by the title, this is part two of my interview with Delegate Eric Zare. So make sure you check out part one first before you watch or listen to this one. So it makes a lot more sense. All that said, to set up the question, do you like the idea of Virginia becoming a split electoral vote state? Right now, there's a couple swing districts, but for the most part, you can generally count on Virginia, 11 congressional districts. Six of them will go blue generally. Four to five will go red which would split our electoral votes. What do you think about that? You know, initially that sounds great because, of course, I'm, I'm lamenting the fact that Virginia is turning blue, and I'd like to see the voices of those of us in these redder districts to be counted at the, the electoral level. I'd have to think that all the way through, and I'm sure there's a reason that it yeah. was, you know, the founders knew what they were doing and, and why they set it up that way. Uh, but it is lamentable when you look at it, the geography of Virginia and you overlay the blue districts with the red districts, yeah. you'd think the entire state is, uh, yeah. is red. It's just the population is so concentrated over there uh, in northern Virginia and on the eastern coast. Yeah. But That's why you can, too, you, you, it's so much easier for them to campaign up there, too, because in a red district, even if the population is somewhat comparable, comparable, however you want to say it, um, let's say there's 3 million in the rest of Virginia and 3 million in Nova, it is an urban area. <clears throat> so, I mean, you might spend a day in Campbell County and knock on 50 doors, yeah. whereas up in Nova, you get a couple apartment buildings, you've just talked to 200 people in a day. So, I mean, that might be a little exaggerated, but that's an example of it. Um, so, yeah, I think it's like the number is like three of the counties in Nova are 60% of Virginia's population. I can't say that definitively but i remember that being the number i heard it's something crazy that like could that be. um i'm guessing it'd be like alamaro fairfax fairfax richmond um loud, not loud that one's a little bit more rural as you get further to the west that one becomes more rural yeah the further southwest you get in virginia the redder and redder it gets i think yeah. there's some counties down in the southwest part of virginia that one that young can won by like with like 95 percent of the votes something like that yeah so um Looking forward to 2024, this election year, we have obviously a big election year nationally. Um, in obviously, you have Trump Biden rematch, uh, you know, the rematch no one wanted. Um, you have the uh, all the Senate or a large portion of the Senate seats up for grabs. I, th I think Trump wanted that rematch. Yeah, I think <laughs> Trump won that. Biden may or may not, and Biden may not know there's a rematch. You never <laughs> right. know. Um, but the Senate... Somebody um, should tell him. Yeah, someone should really it's let too him. late. Yeah. Or else he's going to be stuck in four years again. He's not going to know what's going on. Um, but the uh, uh, presidency's up for grabs. The Senate's up for grabs and is looking very favorable to Republicans. There's some Democrats in seats like Ohio and Montana and West Virginia that are very likely to flip, um, give us control of the Senate. And, of course, you have all 435, I think. 435 congressional votes? 438? I'm questioning myself. All the congressional yeah. seats, I'm blanking at the moment, but all the congressional seats are up for election. And I recently made a video <clears throat> me, where I talked about the two most important congressional um, seats for conservatives to hold this year. Not the most necessarily in the, entire, in the entire country, but the most for conservatives to hold, most important. And that would be Lauren Boebert in Colorado, who is switching districts from congressional district three to four to run there. And there's a rhino there trying to her, her and the Democrats are working hard to get her out. So that's one I noted. The other one would be, and I don't think this is even just like, you know, bias. I think it really is Virginia 5, our congressional district where Congressman Bob Good, shirt I'm wearing, um, is up for re-election this year. And notably, there's a couple big differences between here and 2022 when Bob won re-election for the first time. He's running for his third term now. And that is, um, it is the really big noticeable difference is that there's no convention this year. It's a primary. I'm not going to go through all the details of that again. I've explained it many times on the show. Differences between convention and primary. Because of that, he's a little bit greater threat. There's a lot of outside money coming in the race, and he's running against a rhino candidate who I've also discussed at length on the show before. So what do you think of the state of the race? How do you currently see it panning out? What do you think kind of the, the atmosphere is? Does the other guy have a chance? Does he, um, you know... <clears throat> Do you think Congressman Good's going to win? Why do you support him? All that. Well, I'll tell you, Adam, I've been watching that race you know, <coughs> as, as much as I can, and I am definitely in Congressman Good's camp. I think he's done a tremendous job for us. 
He's gone up to D.C. He's done exactly what he told us he would do. He's been a fighter. He really has mm -hmm. taken on the establishment, and now he's reaping <clears throat> the reward, so to speak, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of money in that swamp, and they've sent money down to a swamp creature to fight to get Bob out. Yeah. Uh, so this really is a fight between we, the conservative grassroots, and the swamp. And the swamp this year is striking back. They're striking back at Bob, our Congressman Good. Uh, they want him out. And so the results of this election, I think, are going to tell, uh, tell a pretty big story about how strong the swamp is versus how uh, deeply concerned the grassroots are. Now, the problem is it's a primary. Not everybody who needs to be is paying attention to a primary. Yeah. Uh, that can go both ways. My, uh, we were talking to a friend yesterday who's, who's moderately pays attention. She does vote in primaries. She didn't know Congressman Good even had a challenger. So, you know, that, that's good, no pun intended, yeah. that uh, you know, people don't realize he's being challenged because he has done such a wonderful job. We really need him to stay in there. We really need people like Congressman Good who have been for the past four years fighting the fight that President Trump got started but wasn't able to complete while the White House has been occupied. So we need to get Congressman Good back in there to support uh, what President Trump will be trying to do. The, so the big thing, the only thing really, that Rhino John McGuire, I'm just going to say his name, we've said on the show before, there's no harm in it. Um, the, the biggest thing he's running, the only thing is that Bob Good is a never Trumper, which, as I pointed out on social media the other day, is ironic, seeing as how Bob supported Trump after the primary in 2020, he supported him fully in 2022, and he has endorsed them in 2024. Initially, like we talked about, he wasn't with Trump, not completely, not because he disliked Trump, he just thought there was a better candidate in the field, as did I. My studio is still decked out in that gear. But now that it's the general election, Bob's like, okay, let's go. It's time for it's time to get President Trump back in. He's completely on board with Trump now. So what do you think? Um, is there any at all sort of merit, in your opinion, to the to the Bob Good doesn't like Donald Trump argument? So it's funny you ask that, Adam, because I was cheering the Re Campbell County Republican <coughs> Committee in 2016 when Donald Trump was running for the first time. Bob Good was on the Campbell Board of Supervisors at that time. So I was, of course, in very close contact. I, I sat beside Bob on the Board of Supervisors. I worked with Bob through that campaign. And if he was a never-Trumper, you would think the chair of the Republican committee would know it. <laughs> there was no clue that Bob would. So all that to say, I know Congressman Good stands for the values that President Trump has promoted and pushed, and I know he's going to continue to do that. I completely agree. And it's very obvious, as I saw someone point out the other day, very obvious that the grassroots, the, the people of the 5th District are very obviously on Congressman Good's side. It's just how many of those, you know, kind of moderate Republicans, so to speak, the establishment types, how many people can you sway and get over with, you know, your hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars being poured in this district to get rid of Bob. Um, and of course, one of the downsides of it being a primary, it's there's no safeguard like there's a convention. You're not supposed to vote in a primary, Republican primary, if you're Democrat and vice versa, but you can't actually stop them. You yeah. come in, you walk in the polls, you're good. The saving grace, as someone else pointed out to me the other day, is that this is uh, there is a Democrat primary on the same day that there's a Republican, so they can't – they'll be in the same uh, precinct. The people will be voting in the same precinct, so they can't really go through the line twice. So that shouldn't be much of a problem this year. We've certainly seen it in years past. Good. <clears throat> However, what do you think, in, in your opinion, um, on a national scale, when you look at presidency, Senate, congressional seat, I don't know how closely you followed it, but just kind of in your gut feeling, how do you think the elections are going to shake out nationally this year? I think nationally, conservatives are going to do well. Because the left hasn't been able to help themselves, they've been pushing this, like we talked about earlier, this, this transgendering, they've been pushing Marxism, critical race theory, they've been really showing what they believe and what they're willing to, to go to the mat for, and it does not line up 
with what Americans believe. America was founded on biblical principles. The American Revolution was vastly different from the French Revolution. The ideas that are infiltrating through the left right now are the ideals associated with the French Revolution. You remember the French Revolution resulted in a reign of terror. Uh, it resulted in a society being flipped on its head. He came into the French Revolution with some Christian influence in France. Much of that was pushed out after, after the revolution. The ideals that drove the French Revolution did not take hold here in America because we had a biblical grounding. Much of that has been eroded, but we still, as a whole, hold to the values that Western civilization is built on. So people are reacting to this. They don't like what they're seeing being done. They're seeing the results to a small degree. They're seeing the results uh, being carried out and perpetrated against our children. And most Americans aren't going to tolerate that. I agree. Now, we talked about um, our, the demographics shift in Virginia. So next year, obviously, last year's 2023, Virginia has off-year elections. They in New Jersey are the only state or we in New Jersey, I should say. Um, so next year, uh, Youngkin's term ends. He cannot run again because Virginia governors can serve up to two terms, but they can't serve them consecutively. Again, the only state like that. So there will be no, no incumbent. There never is. Um, meaning we'll have governorship up next year. We'll have a uh, House of Delegates up next year. I don't think there's state Senate seats next year. No. Okay, I didn't think so because, yeah, they're all at once four years. Okay, but governorship up. Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, everything that was up in 2021, including House of Delegates, because those are two-year terms, up again, 2025. Um, statewide races, there's varying opinions on those. We don't need to get into all that. I personally think Republicans probably aren't going to fare great. They don't usually in two consecutive elections in Virginia, but I digress. How do you think the biggest hope for Republicans in Virginia is that we reclaim the House of Delegates, which is where you're in. It's closest to home for you. And that way, again, like you were talking about, that even that one vote majority can stall the Democrats' agenda. Yeah. What do you think currently are our chances of doing that in 2025, being as we only need to flip one seat to tie it? I think our chances are good. Um, and a lot of that's going to depend on the presidential election, because like you said, it's hard, it's hard to win. In, it's hard for one particular party in Virginia to win in two consecutive years. But we are so close. And what the uh, some of the things that, the Democrats are in the House are pushing. We're going to see a couple of constitutional amendments coming out from them next year. Uh, they're, they're certainly working hard to stifle our Second Amendment rights, uh, but they're in particular coming after our children again, you know, like we, we've been talking about, but also on the, on the uh, abortion front. So there's an amendment that was put in this year. They withdrew it, but we can expect it to come back next year that in essence, allows a baby to be killed at any point, even after birth. It, as long as we can let the public know about that, as long as the public can understand the ramifications of a constitutional amendment like that, and as long as the public knows who's behind that, who's putting that out, that the Democrats are behind this, that they advocate for this, as long as the public understands what it is the Democrats are advocating for, the Democrats are going to lose because Virginians are not going to put up with a party that wants to to allow for a baby to be held and then killed. Yeah. Um, so I think we're going to see, hopefully, them continue to push as hard as they have been, and I think they're going to push the envelope just too far. And we'll have to see if they you know the frog and boiling water analogy comes to play. You know, you start it, you can kill babies at six weeks, then 12, then 15, then 25, and then it's, it's fine. You'll kill them whenever. And then we're starting to see the whole, you know, the, the medical assistance and suicide yeah. uh, so, or, and dying. And so, you know, now, you know, he's 85, he's 80, he's 75, he's 70. So we're just going, we're eventually all going to be dead if it was up to the Democrats. Michael Knowles has prudently pointed out before that if you think about it, if you look at it real hard, all the Democrats' policies come around to making life worse if you have to live, and usually just come around to less people. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. value of human life is is not there for the Democrats. 
they really do because all of this set ties in together they see us they see humanity as the problem there's too much of a worship i'm going to say of the earth yeah. we're to be stewards of the earth we're to use the earth but they see it that as we steward the earth and as we care for the earth that we somehow are the problem and that somehow uh humanity is to blame for this change in, in global temperatures which of course history shows temperatures rise temperatures fall uh, but they're using that to try to make life harder for us to make it more difficult for us to heat our homes <coughs> to travel just to, for daily necessities so uh, they're going to continue to push those sorts of things we're going to continue to hold the standard that life has value that one of the the goals of the state should be to make life better not worse and i think the voters are going to going to see that yeah the first two chapters of genesis make it abundantly clear the earth was created for the pleasure uh and you know the the, the for the uh good of humans well to basically boiling it down but humans are to steward the earth in return um you know but it's not vice versa where Humans were put on earth, you know, God created the earth and that was his goal. And like, okay, you humans go on there just to make sure everything stays fine. Obviously, that wasn't the case. I'm simplifying it majorly, obviously, yeah. but that's basically the case. Um, I need to start to wrap up here. So basically, again, <clears throat> really big elections coming up this year. And as you point out, it's so cliche, but your vote really does matter. It's not like you mentioned those votes, 1,800 votes between five House of Delegates districts. You have... Um, Locally here, we had a school board candidate. So, win a very contested race. It was the Republican running against a long-term incumbent on the school board, like twenty-year incumbent, and another supposed Republican on the school board. And despite having half her votes taken away from the fake Republican, the real Republican still beat the incumbent. But it was by eleven votes. I believe was the final count after a recount. It was originally nine, and it was eleven votes is what she won by. We had another candidate, two Republicans running against each other, kind of a weird year, um, no Democrat, but the guy I was polling for, the more conservative guy, in my opinion, lost by 53 votes. I mean, it's really tight margins. So as we go into, um, yes, general election in November, but especially in June in Virginia and across the country, really big primaries. Uh, West Virginia, I'll use an example, Jim Justice versus Alex Moody. Whichever one of those wins, that district, that state, excuse me, Whichever one of those guys wins, they're going to win West Virginia. Because the only prayer the Democrats had of keeping that one West Virginia Senate seat blue was Joe Manchin running again, and he's not. So whichever one of them wins that, Alex Mooney, seemingly the far more conservative one than Justice, whichever one wins, they're going to be our next senator for West Virginia. And that pretty much is expected 50-50 time in the Senate already. Primaries matter. Obviously, general elections matter. Primaries matter a lot. So as we go into both seasons, what are your was your message to voters? I would remind voters that a vote in a primary is worth so much more than a vote in the general. Because yes. when you get to the general, the candidate's already been chosen. At a primary, you have a much more concentrated vote. Your your vote weighs more. And because there's less people voting, and you're choosing what type of candidate your party is going to put on the ballot. So in essence, you're choosing at that point who you're going to get to vote for in November. Yeah. In Virginia, it'll be the last thing I say before we head out, but in Virginia, for example, we have our Senate primary this year. Uh, June 18th, we're selecting our candidate to hopefully oust Tim Kaine in the general election. But the, the turnout in primaries, it depends on the year, but it can be so low. What you said, your vote really does matter so much. For instance... I don't know the exact number, obviously, but our our uh, Senate candidate, they were, Virginia is about 7 to 8 million people. Close to half of those, we'll call it 45% roughly, are Republicans, even if they're not registered. Virginia doesn't have party registration, obviously, but we'll say 45% are Republicans. We might have, of those 3 to 4 million Republicans, we might have 500,000 people that end up selecting our Senate nominee. Not a lot of people vote in primaries, so you're right. Really does matter. Your votes really do. So as we wrap up, do you have anything else you want to say? Just wanted to say, pay attention to these primaries because this is where it happens. This is where 
we choose who goes on that ballot for November, and we need to have our people uh, choosing the better of the choices. I completely agree. Thank you, Delegate Thank Zara, you. Del Delegate Zara. It's always fun to come on the show with you, Adam. It is. Yes, well, I'm glad to hear that. Yes. Yeah. Always a good time. Um, sounds good to be able to now say Delegate Zare will be reelecting you next year, and hopefully we have a good year for Republicans as a whole. Thank you, folks, for watching. This has been Fight and Revive. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Some end cards will be popping up in a moment. In the uh, outro screen, you'll get to move on to another video, should you so choose. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Fight and Revive with Adam Boyer. We're already being shadow banned on YouTube. So if you would like this specific video and then subscribe to the channel, that would be greatly appreciated and help us reach more people. Thank you for watching.